inclusion, inclusive design, inclusive practice. These are very important words these days in education, and well, they should be. They represent what my friend Leonie Watson calls an aspirational concept. But we haven't found it to be particularly inspirational, at least not when it comes to the day-to-day -day workings of the classroom. It's been much easier to put that thought and that concept into our mission statements, our goal statements, our list of core values, than it has been to make it happen on a day-to-day -day level for all the kids who come into our classrooms. So today, I bring you five rules of design thinking, which we can use to help us reach all students. Rule number one is to teach like you are Banksy. And by that I mean, read the rule book, then rip it up and create something that challenges the accepted wisdom. Now, if you don't know who Banksy is, there are two distinct schools of thought on him. One is that he is a common trespassing street thug who sneaks around at night and scrawls graffiti on other people's private property. Another school of thought on Banksy is that he is an important, talented social activist who calls attention to the injustices of his day. Same person, two different perspectives, and it largely depends on whether you agree with his cause. Now, we don't have many rule breakers in education. The rule breakers in school tended to get enough of school while they were in it, and so they rarely become teachers and administrators, and sometimes I think that's a little bit to our own detriment. And so even if you're sitting there thinking right now, I I'm, not a, I'm not a rule breaker. My guess is, given the right conditions, you are. This is something most of you have never seen before. <laughs> These are the actual published rules of the board game Monopoly. Nobody I know has ever played Monopoly by the published rules. Some of the best fights we got into in college were over how to play Monopoly. People change the rules for all kinds of reasons. Some make the game take longer. Some make the game go shorter. Some make the game louder, some make the game quieter, some make the game, purport to make the game more fair, some actually make the game less fair. But every rule that we keep when we play Monopoly, we've kept it for one very important reason. It made the game more fun. Now in education, we probably feel like we shouldn't say we're making things more fun. That sounds like we're just playing. So we say we are making things more engaging. Anytime there's a rule that prevents a kid from getting the kind of education they should get out of our system, I'm sorry, that is a rule that is begging to be broken. Read the rule book, then rip it up. Create something that challenges the accepted wisdom. Rule number two is to teach like you are Leonardo da Vinci. Now, if you didn't know who Banksy was, likely you know who da Vinci is. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci would have been the modern day guidance counselor's nightmare. Well, Leonardo, I see here on your form, on third period, you've circled both advanced art and physics. Now, you know you can't take both. You'll have to choose one, but that's okay. It's not like you're going to grow up to be both an artist and an engineer, right? <laughs> we still live in a world where there are kids who have to pick between AP English and being in the school band. And that's a problem that we can fix if we will be curious about everything and never stop questioning how we can make things better. You know, when we build a habitat for our pet hamsters, we go to great pains to provide them absolutely everything that they will need. And if we get a hamster who's a little bit different, we'll put them in there. And if they're a, not a very good climber, we'll provide places that they can go to. If they are a little bit on the large side, we might give them a few extra exercise devices to let them use to have fun. But we never really considered building a completely separate environment for that hamster. We do it by adding things to the environment we've already got, not by taking things away. And I wonder sometimes why we don't take that very same approach 
with some of the students that we have that come to us every day. Be curious about everything. Never stop questioning how you can make things better. Rule number three is to teach like you are Chanel. And by that, I mean strive for beauty and elegance, but realize that those are different for different people. One of my favorite writing prompt activities is based on this picture some of you may be familiar with. I pull a little fast one with the people that I show it to. I have them all wearing earbuds, and I tell them to look at this picture and take about two minutes to write down what they think is happening. Now, to half the group, I'm giving, them, I'm giving everybody background music, but half the group is getting a real nice, light-hearted Italian aria. The other half is getting some very slow, sad, somber chamber music. And nobody hears what everybody else is hearing because everyone's using the, the headphones or the earbuds. And when they're done, I start asking them who would like to tell me a little bit about what you think is happening in the picture. And those who were watching, or watching the picture and hearing the aria start saying things like, this is a joyful reunion. Somebody they thought was lost or killed has come home, and they're happy to see them, and this is somebody that they never thought they would see again. But the half who had the slow, somber music are saying, no, this is somebody who's bringing bad news. Somebody has been lost or killed probably in the war, and they're never coming home again. And the realization that comes when they see that the, the difference is not because of the instructions I gave them. I gave both groups the same instructions. I showed both groups the same picture. The only difference was the background music and how it affected how they saw what they saw. Folks, we have people who come to us with all sorts of different background music going on. Every one of you came into this room today with different background music going on. It is no wonder that when we give the same presentations and the same sets of instructions to a wide variety of students that we get such a wide variety of responses from them. It's because of the background music that's going on in their lives, in the students' lives, in our colleagues' lives, and in our own lives. Strive for beauty and elegance, but understand that those things will be different for everyone. Rule number four is to teach like your Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Brunel created such amazing wonders of his day as a tunnel beneath the Thames River. The Great Western Railroad, the SS Great Britain, all amazing, never done before accomplishments of his day. He did it by putting into effect rule number four that says planning is important. But imagination is what makes the extraordinary possible. We don't get new and innovative ideas by doing the same things we've always done, the same way we've always done them. In 1847, though, a bridge that Brunel had, had constructed was ruined when stray embers from a passing locomotive landed on the oak planking and caught the wood on fire and it ruined the iron structure. When this bridge was ruined, a contemporary and a competitor of Brunel's, Robert Stevenson, heard about it. And on his brand new D River Bridge, he decided that's not going to happen to my bridge. And he went out and he had the oak planks coated with ballast to douse any embers that might hit it. The next passenger train that crossed the D River Bridge because of the added weight of the ballast caused the bridge to collapse. Five people died in that tragedy. The British government, as governments often do when there are times of tragedy, stepped in and said, we need to make some rules. And they called on Brunel to give them some ideas on what kind of rules should we put in place for building bridges so that this won't happen in the future. Brunel gave them an answer, but it wasn't the kind of answer they were looking for. Brunel flatly told them, I'm opposed to making rules on how we should build bridges because we're going to make rules that will put into place the errors and prejudices we have today and force us to go by those forever. In other words, Brunel knew we're going to know more about how to build good bridges in 10 years than we know now. 
we're going to know more about how to build good bridges in five years, in one year than we know now. And every time there's a failure, we need to learn from it. They didn't want to build bad bridges. They wanted to learn to build the best bridges possible. Planning was important, but it's imagination that makes the extraordinary possible. So there's four rules. And when I say rules, obviously, I'm meaning guidelines, ideas, tools for the toolbox that you can use when you come across some of these barriers, like the four people I've already discussed. But when I heard Leonie Watson talk about these four, those four rules in terms of digital design, and her applying them from her friend Cameron Sinclair's work on architectural design, I said to myself, there is something about these rules that applies so perfectly to what I do and what my colleagues do in education. But I thought, there's a fifth rule. I know there is. It's hidden in here somewhere, and I've got to find it. And I told my colleagues about it, and they were gracious about my efforts on this. And one day, I came to one of my colleagues and said, I got it. I figured it out. I know what the fifth rule is. And I laid it all out for them. And this was their exact reaction. They looked at me, and they went, oh, nice. <laughs> I thought this was the best idea I had ever had in my life. And it was greeted with a, oh, nice. I was mad. I started questioning the value of whether I had anything good in any of this at all anyway. And then finally, I came to the realization that what I had discovered was not the fifth rule. It was my fifth rule. And that every teacher I have ever known has their own fifth rule. Teachers that I have discussed this with and worked with have come up with a long list of what their fifth rule is and who represents it for them. Even when two people pick the same person, sometimes they'll have a very, very different rule and a very, very different set of quotes or terminology that goes along with it. But I think it's so important that we explicitly and intentionally connect with why we do what we do. Because there is a student in your life who nobody can reach the way you can. And there are students that all of us see every day in school that there are other people who think is unreachable. When you plant lettuce, if it doesn't grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look for reasons it's not doing well. It might need more fertilizer, more water, less sun. You look for reasons it is not doing well, but you never blame the lettuce. Let us resolve, go ahead and groan, <laughs> but the next time you're in the grocery store and you walk through the produce section, you'll think of this. Let us resolve to be relentlessly optimistic about every student because they truly can learn to define and achieve what the highest level of success means for each one of them. Thank you.